Hey everyone, and welcome back to this class, Support Vector Machines in Python. In this lecture, we are going to discuss a new model called the RBF network. We'll see how they are very closely related to SVMs and can in fact, under the right circumstances, be considered equivalent. Let's first look at the SVM model. For those of you who are coming here from the first beginner's corner, this will be your first look at the SVM. For those of you who went through the theoretical sections of this course, this should be a good review. So what do I mean by model? Well, I mean, what equation do I use to get from the input features to the output prediction? For example, with linear regression, my model is y hat equals w transpose x plus b. My modeling assumption is that y hat is linearly dependent on the input features x. So that's what I mean by model. I mean, what's the equation to go from the input to the output? So for the SVM, the equation I use to get from the input to the output is this. In order to do classification, we just take the sign of the output. So if h of x is greater than zero, we predict the positive class. If h of x is less than zero, we predict the negative class. As you can see, this is almost linear, except for this weird k function. Now whether you've taken the rest of this course, or you are coming from the beginner's corner, this notation is probably new to you. So I'm going to explain everything from scratch. If you did the rest of the theory parts of this course, you should be able to relate it back to what you've already learned. First, the function k is what we call a kernel function. And our choice for this kernel function, for the time being, will be the Gaussian kernel, also known as the radial basis function. As you can see, the acronym for radial basis function is RBF, which explains the title of this lecture, RBF Networks. We'll explain this function in more detail later on, but for now, just know that this is the equation. It basically looks like a Gaussian with no constant term. Next, the parameters of the model are alpha and b. We can think of the alphas as weights and b as the bias term. So this is similar to linear regression, where you have w transpose x plus b, where w represents your weights and b is your bias term. Now what is this x tilde and why are we summing from one to l? Well, this is where the magic of the SVM happens. All the x tildes are data points, which we call landmarks or exemplars or prototypes. In SVM theory, we call them support vectors, although this has a very specific meaning. These are just important points for determining our classification rule. So when we count from one to L, that just means that there are L of these important points. You can imagine that for this machine learning problem, these are the important points that help to determine the decision boundary. You can see that the curves are sort of built around these points. At this point, we have to take a little digression to explain the RBF kernel further. First, if you recall, the Gaussian always takes the shape of a bell curve. Since the most outer operation is an exponential, the output of the RBF kernel is always going to be between zero and one. Let's consider when the output is close to zero and when the output is close to one. Well, let's say X is very close to one of our landmarks, X tilde then the distance between x and x tilde is very small, close to zero. Let's assume gamma is equal to one without loss of generality. We'll remind ourselves about the effect of gamma later. Well, e to the power zero is equal to one, so we can conclude that if x is very close to x tilde, then the RBF kernel will return a number very close to one. Now let's consider what happens if x and x tilde are very far apart. In this case, the distance between x and x tilde is large. Let's say, for argument's sake, that they are at a distance of five units away from each other. In this case, we get e to the minus five, which is equal to 0 0.007, which is approximately equal to zero. In other words, when x and x tilde are far apart, the RBF kernel returns a value very close to zero.
putting this together, we can see that the RBF kernel is doing a kind of feature expansion. It's almost giving us binary features. 1 meaning x is close to the landmark, and 0 meaning x is far away from the landmark. So if we pretend our feature value f sub i is equal to k of x tilde i and x, then f sub i is like a binary feature saying, how close is x to x tilde i? On top of that, our classifier is a linear function of these features f sub i. So this is just like doing a feature expansion and then applying a linear classifier on top. Let's solidify this by looking at a picture. Consider this quadratic looking decision boundary. We can think of the red side as plus one and the blue side as minus one. I've highlighted the landmarks so that you can see that there are two red landmarks and one blue landmark. Let's assume our classification rule is as follows. H of x is equal to minus one times k of blue and x plus one times k of red one and x plus one times k of red two and x. Now it's important to keep in mind that this is just a rough example. Don't expect these numbers to be precise or for it to exactly fit the geometrical picture. This is only for intuition. So let's imagine that we have a test point here, which you and I can see clearly belongs to the blue side. Well, we can see that it's pretty close to the blue exemplar, so let's say that kernel gives us a value of 0.5. We can also see that it's pretty far away from both of the red exemplars, so let's say those both give us 0. In this case, h of x is equal to minus 1 times 0 0.5, which is minus 0 0.5. This is less than 0, so we predict minus 1, which is correct. Now let's say we have a point over here, close to the exemplar red 1. Since it's far away from the blue exemplar and red 2, those both give us 0. Let's say the kernel for red 1 gives us 0 0.7. Then h of x is equal to 0 0.7, which is greater than 0, so we predict plus 1, which is correct. Now let's say we have a point which is far along the red side of the boundary, but not really near the exemplars. Still, it's closer to red 1 than it is to the blue exemplar. Let's say that the kernel value for red 2 is 0 0.01, and the kernel for the blue exemplar is 0 0.001. Let's also say that the kernel for red 1 is 0. In this case, h of x is equal to minus 1 times 0 0.001 plus 1 times 0 0.01, which is equal to 0 0.009. This is still greater than zero, so we predict class one, which is correct. In other words, these exemplars give us the decision boundary we expect. You'll notice that there's one parameter we haven't discussed yet, which is gamma. In this lecture, I'll give you the short version, but you're encouraged to check out the previous lecture titled Gaussian Kernel, if you want a more in-depth explanation. You can think of gamma as the precision of the Gaussian kernel. If we have a high gamma, then we have high precision, and the Gaussian kernel is very skinny. If we have a low gamma, then we have low precision, and the Gaussian kernel is very fat. You can see that if the Gaussian kernel is very skinny, it is very conservative as to what data points should be considered close. The value of the Gaussian kernel drops to zero very fast as you move away from the center. If the Gaussian kernel is very fat, it is very liberal as to what data points should be considered close. Even if a data point is far away from the center, you can still get a value which is significantly larger than zero. The result of this is that we can change the expressiveness of the decision boundary. When we have low precision, we can imagine that the landmarks are not very precise, so the decision boundary is smooth. When we have high precision, we can imagine that the landmarks are extremely precise. They allow for sharp corners and turns, giving you a very expressive decision boundary. You can think of this in terms of the bias variance trade-off, or overfitting and underfitting. When we have low precision, we'll have a higher bias, lower variance, and we'll tend to underfit. 
When we have high precision, we'll have a lower bias, higher variance, and we'll tend to overfit. The next question I want to consider is, why is this called an RBF network? Why is this a neural network? You might see this picture a lot and assume it refers to a picture of a neural network in the deep learning sense. But this actually may not be true. In fact, the picture for an RBF network is exactly the same. Sometimes we draw these little Gaussians in the hidden layer to make it more explicit that a Gaussian kernel is being used. And with a deep learning artificial neural network, you might see little sigmoids drawn in the hidden layer to make it more explicit that a sigmoid is being used. Of course, these are arbitrary activation functions and both networks actually have the same architecture. In addition, the operation which is occurring in the input to hidden edge is a little different as well. With regular neural networks, we're calculating a dot product between the input and some weight wi. With RBF networks, we're calculating a squared Euclidean distance between the input and some landmark xi. In some sense, the dot product and Euclidean distance are different ways of doing a similar thing. Of course, we know what Euclidean distance is. It's just the length of the line that connects two points in space. In other words, it tells us how close those two points are. What about the dot product? Sometimes you'll see the dot product referred to as cosine similarity. This is because another way of writing the dot product between w and x is just the magnitude of x times the magnitude of w times the cosine of the angle between w and x. Considering a w and x of constant length, what happens when we change the angle? Well, if w and x are pointing in the same direction, we get cos of 0, which is equal to 1. This gives us the maximum possible similarity. If w and x are perpendicular, we get cos of pi over 2, which is equal to 0. This gives us zero similarity. If w and x are pointing in opposite directions, we get cos of pi, which is minus 1. This gives us the minimum possible similarity. So in fact, the dot product is also a measure of the closeness between two vectors. They are just different kinds of closeness. And thus, RBF networks are actually more similar to deep learning neural networks than you might have thought. One interesting fact is that the Euclidean distance actually breaks down into a dot product. If you recall, the square length of a vector is equal to the vector dotted with itself. Therefore, we can actually expand the square length term, and all we get is a series of dot products. Then we can imagine, in the deep learning neural network sense, that the activation function is the exponential of this series of dot products as its input argument. The last question I want to consider is, how are these landmarks chosen in the first place? And that's also the most important question. If we don't choose these landmarks wisely, then we'll have poor features and our classifier won't be good. So how do we choose the best landmarks possible? And more importantly, where do these landmarks come from? In fact, these landmarks are actually just data points from the training set. So if you wanted to be lazy, one thing you could do is just include all the points from your training set and sum from 1 to n. Now you might wonder, that seems very inefficient. What if my training set is large? Of course, there are other ways around this. If you took the previous theory part of this course, then you know that the landmarks x of i are actually called support vectors, and they are chosen by optimizing a quadratic program. This makes it so that the number of landmarks is much less than the number of training points we have. One problem with both of the above two methods is that they actually aren't very efficient. The first method is inefficient for the reason we already discussed. If it depends on the training set size, then it won't work for large data sets. But the SVM method is also susceptible to the same problem. 
It promises to only find a few support vectors, but the number of support vectors still tends to grow. This makes both training and prediction slower, as you saw when we used the SVM on MNIST, which has about 40,000 samples in our version of the dataset. In the next lecture, we'll discuss some other ways of obtaining an approximate answer for which data points should we consider our landmarks. In short, these will make our calculations more efficient while still providing the benefits of this nonlinear model.